okay. No. Okay. And we continue with the second part of the lecture. And the, oh, wait a moment. Sent it shown on the screen. It is on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we continue with one important uh, point. I mean, all these are important points, uh, issues. Now that we uh, discussed a bit more in detail uh, the possibility to have fluorescence from an excited state to the ground state or other processes that are relaxing energy, we can introduce uh, these transition probabilities K sub R and K sub non and and air, no radiative. Once a molecule is in an excited state, it will have a probability to relax by emitting light. And this is K sub R. It's a number between zero and one. Okay, it is a probability. And the molecule will have the probability to emit energy to relax energy not radiatively with the with the uh, uh, we can show that the fluorescence uh, quantum yield you remember what is the quantum yield is the numbers of photons that you meet divided by the number of photons that you absorb okay can be written in such a way so it is the ratio of the relative probability divided by the sum of the probabilities okay of course uh, you know that if these are probabilities the sum of k r and k sub n r must be one because the total probability must be one. But very often in spectroscopy, instead of using transition probabilities, you use transition rates, number of process per second. And these are not normalized to one. These are not. So this is a sort of norm normalization. Your fluorescence quantum yield is the ratio between the rate of a light emission divided the, the sum of the rates of all processes that you can have okay now uh, of course this ratio here is less or equal to one okay now what does it happen if the non-radiative probability is zero what does it happen? If you excite a molecule with one photon, it will go here and will emit surely a photon. Okay? And therefore, if K sub n r is zero, this ratio here is one, and you have fluorescence quantum yield that is one. Okay? On the other hand, if you have a the probability to have a non radiative uh, probability, then this denominator here is larger than the numerator, and the fluorescence quantum yield is less than one. Okay. 
Now, if the probability to have a non-radiative process is much larger than the probability to have a radiative process, so if this number is much larger than this, in this denominator, this can be neglected, okay? And this ratio is much less than one and can be almost zero. So the, your fluorescence yield will be zero, okay? Now, what is the difference? I always use your things. No, I have a better one. What is the difference between the molecules that they used to color these bottles and the molecules that they used to color this? This molecule here, they have got a very large K sub non radiative. They can relax energy by non radiative processes. So they absorb green and blue light because in the reflectance, the, this is red. So you miss the green and blue. Okay. They absorb light, but then they relax non radiatively and they do not emit light. Okay. So you have the impression that this is not fluorescing. The molecules here, they absorb in the blue green, okay? Let's say blue, violet, a bit of green, not too much because the yellow is close to the green and they emit in the yellow. So in this case here, this process is more probable than this and the fluorescence quantum yield is large, okay? So what is the fluorescence quantum yield connected to? to the relative uh, probabilities to have a radiative and non-radiative process, okay? Uh, it is uh, uh, always, uh, sometimes one uses the word quench, that means that you write the non radiative channels, these channels here, quench the radiative process. What does it mean, quench in English? To put in a corner, to depress, to decrease, to diminish. Okay? So the, these processes uh, uh, change the, the number of processes uh, that I give rise to emission of light. Now, but one uh, must be careful. So these channels here, this, the, the reason why you have these non-radiative processes can be chemical reactions in excited state. For example, the molecule is here and uses its energy reaction. Or you can have intersystem crossing. So you can have the transition here by intersystem crossing. You can create complexes between two different molecules. You can have a collision. So the molecule can collide with another molecule and relax the energy. And there can be one process that is named first transfer that we discuss separately, first transfer. So, all these mechanisms, non radiative processes, are given by, su by such kind of uh, interactions. And among these interactions, there is one particular one that we call first transfer that is very important in microscopy. Okay. So we discuss it separately. I'm sorry, it's not this one, it's this one. Now, what is first transfer? Now, think that you have a, an organic molecule, this molecule here, and think that, and we call it M, that it has got a ground single state and a first excited state. By means of light, you can promote this molecule from the ground state to the excited state, okay? If the molecule is isolated, it is alone, 
it will stay here for some time and it can relax by emitting light or relax non negative but now let's think that your molecule is very close to another molecule that we call the quencher okay that is here and that they are very close to each other in the range of tens of nanometers we shall see this then what can happen it can happen that this molecule is excited to the excited state and that it gives its excess energy to the quencher so it passes the energy to the quencher okay and when it passes the energy to the quencher it goes back to the to the ground state contemporary the quencher goes to the excited state so there is an exchange of energy between the molecule and the quencher the quencher takes the extra energy okay now the quencher can do two different things if it is a molecule with a high fluorescence quantum yield no, it can relax and emit light okay if it is a molecule with a low fluorescence quantum yield it can dissipate the energy by a non-radiating process okay so in both cases here there is a so-called Furster transfer this process here of energy transfer is named Furster transfer and the, the final result is connected to the characteristic of the emitters okay now from the point of view of chemical formulas one can say that one molecule is promoted by light to the excited state then the molecule in the excited states interacts with the quencher and the end you in the end you have the molecule in the ground state and the quencher in the excited state and then the quencher can relax to the ground state okay and typically we shall see this this process takes place when these molecules are in a range of distance that is less than 10 nanometers we will go back to this okay now what does it mean it means that if i evaluate the fluorescence quantum yield of a molecule when there is the possibility to add first transfer okay that is this ratio here you remember then you will write like this you write the fluorescence quantum yield is the probability to emit radiatively divided by the probability to emit radiatively plus the probability to have all the other non-radiative processes plus the probability to have the first transfer process so we separate in this group of interactions we separate force transfer from the others okay we, we we describe them separately then you will have this and of course i forgot uh, when we discussed the previous uh, slide i can show you here you always have to remember that if you excite a material in which you have molecules this material here if you excite this material the amount of light that you measure by fluorescence is proportional to the fluorescence quantum yield no so the fluorescence intensity is proportional to the quantum yield if the quantum yield is zero you don't measure any fluorescence and always remember that the fluorescence uh, intensity depends also on the absorption coefficient of this material at the wavelength of excitation and it also depends on the intensity of excitation if you excite with much light you have much fluorescence and so on
And here, of course, the fluorescence intensity that you measure in the presence of first transfer will be proportional to this quantum yield. Okay. Now you can say, okay, let's calculate this ratio here. What is this ratio? It is the ratio of the fluorescence intensity that you measure for a molecule when there is no first transfer divided by the fluorescence intensity that you measure when there is first transfer. As a matter of fact, what are you doing? You are saying, okay, let's think that I have molecules of the type M in a, in a solution, for example, or in a matrix, and that they are alone, isolated. So there are no quenchants on the side. Then if you excite this molecule, you will measure a certain fluorescence intensity. And then you put the quenchers close to the molecule and you measure again the intensity. Of course, since this molecule gives energy to this one, you will measure less fluorescence, okay? So you can calculate this ratio here, that is the ratio between the two quantum yields. And when you calculate this ratio, this is, uh, of course, the two denominators uh, go up to the denominator, you get this, then you uh, separate the, the numerator contribution, you have one plus this ratio here, the probability to have the first transfer divided the sum of radiative and non-radiative processes, where these are all radiative processes, but the first transfer, okay? So that means that if you have a zero probability to have fluorescent transfer, this term is zero, the ratio here is one. You measure the same fluorescence when the quencher is there and when it is not there, clearly. If the, there is a probability to have first transfer, so see if this process takes place, this number is larger than one, this ratio is larger than one, that means that this intensity is lower than this intensity. You measure less fluorescence when you have a first transfer. Why? Because instead of fluorescing, you are giving the energy to somebody else, to the, to the quench. That is taking away the energy. Now, we can define the efficiency of the first transfer process as one minus this quantity. And if you remember, this was one plus this. Uh, one mile uh, of this term here, then this fluorescence uh, uh, efficiency is given by this term here. And you see that if the probability to have the first transfer is zero, the efficiency of the process is zero, and so on. Okay, now. This efficiency of the first transfer uh, process depends on some uh, groups of parameters. First of all, it depends on the distance between donor and acceptor. Okay? So if donor, if the molecule and the quencher are far from each other, the process doesn't take place and this efficiency is zero. Okay, if they get close to each other, the more they are close, the more the process is efficient. And this is one first question. The second, the second question that this efficiency depends, and we must be careful here, on the superposition of the emission spectrum of the donor and absorption spectrum of the acceptor. Now, here I use the words donor and acceptor. What do we mean? It's clear, what do we mean? We mean that if I have a molecule 
and I have a quencher, I can call this the donor and I call this the acceptor because the molecule gives the energy to the acceptor. Okay, so we can use this notation. And uh, we understood that if this is wavelength and this is spectrum, we understood that normally a molecule is characterized by an absorption spectrum and by an emission spectrum, okay? And that the emission takes place at a wavelength that is longer than the absorption peak. This is, you remember why? Because if I have a, a molecule, I can absorb from here to here, then I will have relaxation here and I can emit from here to here and I can also relax here. So normally the emission wavelength is longer than the absorption wavelength. And there is the Stokes sheet, okay? So this is true for the molecule, okay? Now, if this is the scheme of the, mole the, of the molecule, the quencher must be characterized by electronic levels, okay? That they have got an emission, an absorption band that corresponds to the emission band of the uh, molecule. So the quencher should have an absorption spectrum. This is Q absorption band. And this is Q emission band. Okay. So the absorption band of the quencher must correspond to the emission band of the molecule. Okay. Now there is a very simple uh, description of this that we can make that however is wrong okay what is the description that i can do say i am the molecule okay say he is the quencher okay quencher look at me say he is the quencher i am excited and I emit at the wavelength of 500 nanometers. My emission is peaked at 500 nanometers. He is a quencher. He must absorb the light at that wavelength. Okay? So his absorption band must correspond to my emission band. But this model is wrong. So, and you have to cancel from your mind. First, the transfer is not a process in which one molecule emits a photon, a photon and the other molecule absorbs that photon. There is no real photon involved in this process. Be careful to this. There is no real emission of light and absorption of light. Nevertheless, from the theory of first transfer, it comes out that there must be this superposition, okay? So this is the second position. Then there must be a mutual orientation of the donor and acceptor. And we shall see this thing more in detail later on. You know that one emitter can be modeled as a dipole emitter and a dipole is an antenna, okay? And you know that if you have an antenna, the antenna in radio waves does not emit along the direction of the antenna, but it emits perpendicularly with the lobe of emission, okay? 
So if I have two dipoles, okay, they will interact by first transfer if they are properly aligned to each other. If they are, for example, parallel or antiparallel, they will interact. But if they are like this, they will not interact by first transfer. So there is a, a contribution of the mutual orientation of the two molecules. It will depend on how they are oriented, okay? Now, it can be shown that this efficiency of the first transfer process scales like this formula here. So the efficiency is given by one divided one plus the distance between the two molecules r divided by a characteristic distance that is named the first radius. This is called the first radius to the power of six. So if you have a, a couple of molecules that are characterized by a certain first radius, for example, five nanometers, if you, the distance between your molecules is much larger than five nanometers, this ratio is much larger than one, will destroy this, this ratio goes to zero and the efficiency is zero. So if the molecules are much farther than the first radius, then there is no first transfer process. If they get closer than the first radius, then this ratio becomes large and you have a certain efficiency of the process, okay? Now, it can be demonstrated that the sixth power of this first radius is connected to this expression here. And we don't uh, calculate where it comes from, but there are some numerical factors, nine under 28, five to the power of five, logarithm 10. This is the quantum yield of the molecule. So this radius depends on the quantum yield of your molecule. This is a, a factor K squared that takes into account the mutual orientation of the molecules. So the mutual orientation is here. This is a factor J that takes into account the superposition of the emission and absorption bands of the two molecules. This is the refractive index of the medium in which the two molecules are. So if you are in water, in air, or in glass, this will have a a different value, and this is the Avogadro number, okay? So the first radio depends on some of these quantities. Now I ask you the following question. Have you ever seen in your student life a formula where you have one plus, one divided one plus the sixth power of the distance? Have you ever seen a formula in your life? You must have seen it somewhere, you have seen it. Sixth power, this is characteristic. Try, you know, it's not an exam. <laughs> Tell it. When do you see one over one plus sixth power of the distance? Not enough coral girls. In Italian also, and I translate. Never seen. You've seen, but you don't remember. Something about the potential. What potential? Leonard, Leonard. Leonard Jones. What is describing Leonard Jones? But when do you see this?
in chemistry. How does it scale? Bonding energy. Which bonding energy? When? If you have two charges, plus and minus, the bonding energy scales like one over R to the six. No. Scales like one over R, the Coulomb potential. When do you have one over the power six? When you have actually no. When do you have scaling six power? When you have forces between dipoles. And which formulas describe forces between dipoles? Van der Waals forces or London forces. Dipole dipole interaction is described by one over the power of six. So in first transfer, you find this because this is. Uh, a dipole dipole interaction. These are two dipoles that are interacting with each other donor and the acceptor. Okay. So we will go back. Now we introduced the first transfer, and we shall see when we will discuss uh, microscopy how first transfer is used in the so called. Fret microscopy, first resonant energy transfer microscopy. For the moment, we don't tell more than this. Okay. Okay. Now, finally, what time is it? A quarter to, to twelve. Finally, we make a review of the fluorescence spectrum of uh, some molecules, and we go back to endogenous chromophores so chromophores that you can have in your body like phenylalanine tyrosine tryptophan you remember these were the absorption spectrum of these three amino acids and you see that the emission spectra of these three amino acids are this one now what does it come to your mind if you look at this and you look at that and you are in, view, in search of an application. You are an engineer who is helping a biologist. What do you think if you see this and that? You, you are Elon Musk, you want to earn money, okay? What do you think if you see that and that? You are looking for an application. So a biologist is coming to you with a bottle and says, what is inside here? Tyrosine or phenylalanine or tryptophan? What, is, what do I have here? And what, what do you think if you see that? Simple, eh? But this is much more simple to discriminate here. You see, there is a, a shift of the peak. And here, if you perform a measurement, these are peaked in the same position. This is very low. You don't see it much. It's much more simple to see. So you can discriminate amino acids much better in fluorescence than in absorption by measuring this rather than that. Remember, this is the emission spectrum. This is the absorption spectrum. Okay. But always keep in mind that for these amino acids, for example, tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine, the quantum yield is different. This is 0.2, 20%. This is 0 0.14, 14 14%. This is 0 0.04, only 4%. You see that 
it's much more noisy okay and uh, here you get the lifetime and typically the lifetime the of fluorescence lifetime is 2.6 nanoseconds 3.6 nanoseconds 6.4 so each molecule has got its own lifetime and it has got its own quantum yield and uh, if i tell you okay do you hint any connection between these values and this value here do you have any feeling if the lifetime is small the quantum yield is large and say i am a molecule okay i am excited and this is the emission huh? this is the emission see he is the non radiative channel he is blame take this away from my my hands hey take this away take 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 this take from my hand not there from my hand take it take it if the emission lifetime is short the non radiative channel doesn't work if take it now if the emission lifetime is long it do it can do it if the molecule emits quickly the quantum yield is larger because there is a competition between the two channels okay if you review the absorption we already saw these curves in the emission spectra of typical uh, molecules used in microscopy DAPI, pitch and texas red you see that DAPI is absorbing uh, with a peak at this wavelength and it is emitting with a shifted peak it emits at about uh, 480 nanometers okay so there is a shift between the emission wavelength and the absorption wavelength and the same is for pitch and the same is for texas red and you see that the emission curve of Texas Red is a replica with a mirror image of this one. Okay. If you go to cyanides, and here you have the absorption and emission spectra together, you see that the blue curve is the absorption of a cyanine tree, and the channel curve is the emission of cyanine tree. And this is a replica. And there is a stoke shift. This is a stoke shift here, a stoke shift here, and a stoke shift here. And depending on the length of this double bond, you shift both the absorption and emission spectra. Okay. And if you go to the Alexa fluor dyes, you will find on with spectra viewer, you go on the internet and you can find the spectra, you can see them. Now among uh, emitting molecules during the last 20 years let's say 15 years because the nobel prize is with which here is the nobel prize 2008 during the last 13 years the molecule that is most used in biology to label materials is the so-called green fluorescence fluorescent protein and its derivatives now before 2008 there were two researchers who were studying light emitted by jellyfishes you know what is a jellyfish uh, it is this uh, salentrate living in the ocean that is jelly transparent and there are some of them who are emitting light okay there were chemists who isolated 
the parts of this fish that were emitting light and found that the emission comes from a protein. And this protein is characterized by some beta sheets and some from some alpha helices. And it forms a sort of, of cylinder, okay, a barrel, similarly to what you have in rhodopsin, the receptor of the eye. Okay. And inside this barrel, there is a molecule that is fluorescing. It's a fluorescent emitter. And uh, this uh, green fluorescent protein was isolated. And it, it was shown that this molecule has an absorption spectrum that is peaked at 470 nanometers and an emission spectrum that is peaked uh, at a longer wavelength with a typical structure of an organic emitter, okay? With a stoke shift, with a symmetric shape, exactly what you have in the dye that you use to, uh, for your marker, exactly the same, okay? Later on, they demonstrated that you can isolate several different proteins that are not only green fluorescence, but red fluorescent protein or blue fluorescent protein or channel fluorescent protein. You can find many of these proteins in nature or you can synthesize them or modify them in the laboratory. And this was the Nobel Prize of 2008. Now, why is this very important? This green fluorescent protein, you, you could say, okay, why do I need to kill so many jellyfishes to have a, a bottle of this coloring agent and use in microscopy if I can take color from somebody uh, producing tissues uh, in any industry? Why should I? No? Because this is a, a protein and it is compatible with any biological material. First. Second. No? If I take the DNA of the Muro, Mario, Muro, if I take his DNA no? from a cell, and then I scan the DNA of the Muro, okay, and I found the gene of his hair on the DNA, I find the gene, okay, I open that gene sequence. And I can do nowadays. I open the gene sequence and I say, okay, I cut here. And I had here the gene sequence of the green fluorescent protein. Okay. I cut this here, then I replace and connect the DNA properly. I take this DNA strand and introduce in a gamut that I use to create a, a new organism in a, in a bottle. I make in vitro replication. I generate a new version of the Muro, exactly the same. But when the, in the fabrication of his body, there will be the replication of the DNA. And when the hair will be fabricated, the, in the transcription, inside the cell, the, transcript, the transcriptase will find, after the A sequence, will find the protein, the green protein protein, and will synthesize the green fluorescent protein. And he will have hairs with green fluorescent protein that are fluorescing, okay? So I can introduce the green fluorescent protein sequence in any part of the gene sequence of an organism. And I can get, and there are plenty of images in the internet, mice, ma, a mouse with the green hair that is fluorescing, that I shine light on top of him and is fluorescing in the green. If you like uh, the Big Bang Theory, do you like this? In the first uh, series, Sheldon has got at a certain moment on his uh, desk, a bowl with a fish that is fluorescing. 
because it is a genetically modified fish with difference in protein in its sequence. Okay, now these proteins are extremely very important because they can be encoded in the DNA, in the genes of an organism. And you can have, you can have it expressed where you like. So if I want to study a cell, okay, and I want to label the mitochondria of this cell, then I can selectively modify the genome of the cell and introduce the GFP sequence in the region where there is the, the mitochondria uh, code and the, molecule, the cell will express GFP only in the mitochondria or only in acting filaments, wherever I like. And if I am really cool, I can insert the sequence of green fluorescent protein in the mitochondria, of blue fluorescent protein in the nuclei, in, of the red fluorescent protein in the uh, acting filaments, and I will have that different fluorescent spectra from different, different regions of the cell. That's worth of at least three Nobel Prizes. One is not sufficient. They should have given three. Okay. Anyhow, we stop here, and next time we speak a bit about temporal decay of fluorescence, so fluorescence lifetime, and we go back to some concept here. Is it okay?